Hey, y'all. It is Dr. Jada again. Let's dive right into it. We're talking about Terrence Bradley today, and we're going to look at the psychological implications of lying on the stand. In other words, lying under oath. And so quick little brief summary. Uh, we want to we make sure that, again, before we look at this, I'm not trying to diagnose anybody, but it's just so fascinating to me that some of the stuff that we see in our favorite court dramas is actually playing out on real life stage. And so this is just all very interesting and, and fascinating. So um, this real life situation in Georgia, of course, we have um, District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who has made a case against Donald Trump. But the twist is some people are saying that Willis and Nathan Wade were romantically involved, which could, of course, be a big problem. However, Terrence Bradley, he's supposed to be the key witness in proving this romance, along with Willis's friend, who is Mrs. Yurti. Um, but it, it turns out that uh, Bradley, specifically Terrence Bradley, who was Nathan Wade's business partner or partners in their law firm, he was actually more involved in trying to dig up a little bit of dirt on Willis and Wade. Um, and I'll be honest, many of us didn't even realize it until we saw the text messages, because it was in the leaked text messages that we realized that, oh, snap, he is giving Ashley Merchant all the dirt on both Fanny and Wade's relationship and where they were traveling to and some of the things that they were doing and where they were having sex and um, what they were doing at her office, who she shared with another attorney when they were in private practice and just a lot of different details and different nuances in this um, relationship that I know for a fact, Ashley Merchant had no clue. She may have suspected but she didn't have all the details and Terrence Bradley gave her the details. And so when Ashley finally got Bradley on the stand to testify, he really didn't deliver what uh, Ashley Merchant expected. And so, you know, he couldn't remember important details. He seemed um, a little, he, he definitely had some amnesia because I was like, Mm, you're taking too long to answer that and just just come on out and tell it because I know you know it but you're kind of holding back a little bit and I did think that he was um, potentially being coached by uh, his attorneys on the sideline where you know he'd hesitate for a minute and then all of a sudden one of the attorneys would say objection and I'm like okay what's going on here but um, I don't know what do you all think about that that piece of it because I did uh, feel that Ashley Merchant had um, there was something to her argument that uh, he was kind of just taking his time to answer, hoping that his attorneys were going to object. Anyway, so um, again, he had selective amnesia. Um, he seemed really uncertain and unsure about what he was saying. And it, it honestly, from my perspective, it just seemed like he was trying to decide whether or not he was going to lie. And so that was interesting. So the text message exchange. Let's talk about that for a minute. So this text message exchange between Bradley and Merchant was interesting because, again, um, they defined themselves as friends. And in the text messages, Bradley talked about not wanting initially to be directly involved in the case, but he still gave Merchant the names of the people who knew about Willis and Wade's relationship. Again, he said, ask Yerty. Um, he even went as far as to, you know, talk about, um, Willis's children. And I just thought, oh my goodness, that would just be, that's just wicked to, you know, bring the kids on the stand to testify against their mom. But again, uh, Bradley did suggest that. Um, it, it was interestingly surprising that in the text messages, and I don't know um, if any of you all have had, because there's like 35 pages from my understanding, 33 or 35 pages, 30 something pages of text messages. And if you had a chance to review them all, I've gone through all of the text messages because, again, I just wanted to see this relationship dynamic and how it unfolded and what it means. And, of course, there were some who said that Bradley, in his own little way, was attempting 
to date merchant. Um, I don't know, but there was definitely some sort of interesting, I don't know if it was flirtation. I don't know if I'd call it flirtation, but there was some friendliness there. But it seemed to me, if, if I'm honest, that merchant may have been kind of using her uh, femininity and her, she was using her, she was working her jelly. That's, that's what I'll say. She was definitely, I think, working Bradley to get the information uh, that that she needed. So um, he also, uh, Bradley also said some not so kind things about Wade and Willis. And uh, he definitely said that they would lie on the stand. Now it, that is absolutely bonkers. It's bizarre. Bradley told Merchant he, because Merchant said, do you think they'll deny? He said, definitely. I, they will, they, they're going to deny it. They are, in other words, they're going to get on the stand and they're going to deny that they had the relationship, that, or more specifically, that the relationship started um, prior to uh, District Attorney Willis becoming District Attorney. So ultimately... Uh, people were wondering if Bradley could really be trusted as a witness and if this could ultimately affect the case against Trump. So at one point, Bradley and Mergent even talked about, um, like I said earlier, bringing in Willis's children, which, I, you know, that to me would, I know people do it, but to go this far in helping uh, merchant do this. I just felt that that was certainly crossing the line. But again, who am I? What do you all think about that? I'd love to know. Um, but despite Merchant's effort, the truth is she couldn't get more than one witness to confirm that the relationship started before Wade got appointed, except uh, Mrs. Yearty. And so I do know Ms. Yearty also said that um, there was a relationship back in 2019. And so really we have two. So um, other than those two people. Um, so again, now it's pretty much up to the judge to decide how important the revelation of these text messages are. And so what I want to do right now is I want to take a look at the text messages and go through them really briefly. Um, pulling it up now. Okay, here we go. So as you can see here. All right, so Ashley Merchant says, um, and this was back, and, and this is another thing. This happened back in, the conversation of the text message was in January of 2024. So fast forward to Bradley being on the stage talking about, um, I don't remember. I'm like, how do you not remember anything that you communicated to someone a month ago or three weeks ago? Like that was absolutely bizarre. But anyway, Ashley Merchant says last trip was this summer, May or June. And Terrence says, no, I didn't know. I was gone by then. Because remember, Wade and the other partner, I believe his name is Chris, they had to let Bradley go from the um, from their partnership, their law partnership, because Terrence Bradley was accused of sexual, um, some sexual issues with women in the office, and I believe a client. So there was some issues there, but he says, I was gone by then. It doesn't surprise me they took many trips to Florida, to Texas. And then Ashley hops in and says, and Napa. And then um, Terrence said, California. So he's feeding information. And then Ashley's like, yep. And then fast forward, um, Terrence says, when she moved her daughter there, meaning California. Now, Ashley goes on and says, I can't believe they were so carefree. I'm going to try to anticipate her response when I blow this up. She says, I am trying to anticipate her response when I blow this thing up. So it's understood that they're communicating for this specific purpose to literally take down 
Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade along with her. So Terrence goes on to say her daughter flunked out of FAMU and moved to Cali. She says, do you think it started before she hired him? Terrence says, absolutely, period. Now, if you all remember all of the things that took place on the stand, every time, this was a contention. This was a serious argument between Terrence and Ashley when, um, when Terrence was on, on the stand because Terrence said, when he said absolutely, that was referring to something else he said. But Ashley kept driving home, no, that was specifically to this issue of did it start before she was in office? And based on the text messages, it looks like he said absolutely. Now, we're talking about lying under oath. Now that we've laid that foundation, and I know I did a quick little summary hang in here because now we're going to talk about the psychological implications of lying under oath. So what does all of that really, really mean? Why is it important? Why do we even care? Well, from a psychological perspective, this particular portion, and I'm talking about lying under oath, can be examined through the lens of interpersonal dynamics and also cognitive biases. And so what does that mean? So the discrepancy between Bradley's confident tone in his text messages and the uncertainty during his testimony, it could be analyzed in terms of what we call cognitive dissonance. So I'm just going to throw that out there, see what you all think about that, because cognitive dissonance occurs when individuals experience discomfort due to holding conflicting beliefs or attitudes about a specific issue. So of course, Bradley may have initially been confident about all the things he told Ashley Merchant, but when he realized that he was gonna be on the stand, because I remember when Ashley slipped it in in the text messages, she said, I may have to call you. And when she said that, I knew. I knew she was setting him up because she got all of this information from him. And then after she got the information, along the way, she realized that, you know what? You're going to have to testify to all of this information that you gave me. And then when it hit him, and I, I, we don't know when it hit him. We don't know when he realized that, oh, snap. She's going to call me and I'm going to have to tell them all the information that I gave her on the down low, on the, on, you know, on the dirty under, under the table information. And then he had to make a decision. Now, when faced with that discomfort, that pressure of testifying under oath, leading to his hesitation. And so when we tie in the psychological perspective um, of this, it leads to Bradley being under scrutiny for witness credibility. So here we go. The discrepancies between Bradley's confident assertions in the text messages and his uncertainty or perceived uncertainty, which most people say it was just straight up lies. His uncertainty during testimony could raise the question about witness credibility. And of course, from a psychological standpoint, you know, of course, memory distortion. I would say that the memory distortion would be him creating a narrative or getting with his team, creating a narrative that um, puts him in a situation where he could say, well, no, this is actually what I really meant when I said that. Because remember, when it comes to text message messages, there's always some form of uh, information getting lost in translation. So there is that umbrella of um, discrepancy. Um, then it, you know, the social pressure definitely could could have caused Bradley to say, "Yeah, I might as well just lie. I might as well just lie." Number two, emotional bias. So emotions definitely can play a significant role in decision making and perception, and in this case specifically. Um, I believe that the emotions of anger, resentment, 
and loyalty may have influenced Bradley's actions and, and even his interpretations. Because I do believe at some point he realized, because remember, he thought he was doing something that nobody else knew. Remember, Wade didn't know. Willis didn't know. Actually, nobody really knew because I can remember people saying, oh, my God, I cannot believe that he was helping Merchant behind the scenes take down Wade and Willis. So, again, nobody really knew. But his emotions toward Willis and Wade could have certainly fueled Bradley's willingness to provide information to Merchant and then his determination to help her pursue the case, potentially affecting his own objectivity and, and judgment. And so, again, when I look at this, I just go, okay, all of these things are happening, but he still had to make a choice. He still had to make a choice to lie under oath. And I could, just the pressure of that, I suspect, um, was overwhelming. Now, let's look at a couple of psychological theories and concepts that could potentially apply to lying under oath. Um, and, and I'm going to, this may be more for um, psychology students than, than anything, but I um, will certainly say um, it's interesting stuff. So um, theory of mind. So theory of mind refers to the ability of um, the ability, the ability to understand and to attribute mental states such as beliefs, intentions, and desires to yourself, to oneself, and to others. In the context of lying under oath, individuals may use their understanding of others' perspectives to anticipate how their falsehoods might be perceived. And so what they'll do is they'll craft a narrative of deception that aligns with their audience's expectations. So interestingly enough, for, for Bradley, remember, he's an attorney. So his immediate audience is going to be the court. It's going to be the attorneys. It's going to be the judge. It's going to be the people who he knows understands the law. And so I saw him dancing around um, his interaction with Merchant to, um, to really save face. And as sad as that is, it's, it, it is sad to see someone under that kind of pressure. But at the end of the day, um, again, he, ha he had to make a choice. Um, let's talk about social identity theory. Uh, this theory, it explores how individuals, uh, an individual sense of self is shaped by their involvement, their connectivity, or their membership to specific social groups, and how they, again, try to maintain a positive social identity. So when we're talking about lying under oath, you know, again, for Bradley, this could have been driven by his desire to protect his social identity, his reputation. Again, his rep reputation in the legal community, his reputation um, as a man, his reputation, um, you know, within his family unit and structure. So again, an individual, and I believe Bradley did this to some degree, um, distorted the truth to uphold a favorable image of himself and his affiliations um, at the expense of being honest. And uh, again, that's a challenge. Um, another one is the cognitive dissonance theory. I talked about cognitive dissonance a little bit earlier, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. But cog cognitive dissonance, that really um, takes place when people experience psychological discomfort due to holding um, conflicting beliefs, attitudes, or behavior. So like I mentioned that earlier, um, sometimes it, it, I like to say it causes a form of incongruence inside. You know, you, you have these conflicting beliefs and you're just like, oh no, what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? How am I going? And so to reduce the discomfort, individuals may rationalize um, their dishonesty. Like, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know, like, all of us in some way have stretched the truth <laughs> or told those little white lies. Well, in this um, context, lying under oath, it's to 
you have to rationalize in your head. This is what happens when people people cheat, right? You're you're you cheat on your spouse or you cheat on your significant other. And next thing you know, you've rationalized your dishonesty or you minimized its significance. And you kind of convince yourself that your actions were justified or necessary. And the reality is we saw Nathan Wade do this when he kind of rationalized um, that he wasn't married or the man. No, not that he wasn't married, but the marriage had ended, which is why he started a relationship with Willis. Okay. So that's the cognitive dissonance. All right. And then there's the attribution theory. And, and this, uh, this pretty much just says that um, it, it explains the causes of one's own behaviors and assigns meaning to the behaviors of others. And so when Bradley, again, lying under oath, um, you know, he, I think he engaged this attributional process to justify his dishonesty um, in a way. And he looked his actions of what, because remember he did lie. When Ashley Merchant asked him why he left his law practice or why he was no longer a part of the law practice, he didn't tell the truth. And so um, the pressure from others or I believe the perceived perceived injustice of being let go from the law practice, he wasn't able to accept responsibility and therefore he had to continue the lie. So he didn't own whatever that was happening. They, they didn't go into detail about it. They did not go into detail. However, he didn't accept full responsibility. And he had all of this bitterness and this, um, he attributed the reason for his lying under oath to some form of injustice in some way. Again, rationalizing it as well. And then um, finally, finally, I hope you all hung in here with me. Finally, the self-regulation theory. This um, pretty much focuses on how individuals uh, monitor, control, and modify their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors to achieve their goals. Whatever the whatever the goal is or the outcome they're looking for or desiring, lying under oath may involve kind of the self-regulatory process aimed at, again, managing emotions, suppressing guilt or anxiety, and maintaining the facade of confidence or credibility. And, and I personally think we've seen a lot of that in Wade. We've seen it in Willis. We, we see it in um, uh, parents, Bradley. And, and so individuals who um, have to protect themselves in this way may employ strategies such as cognitive rehearsal, emotional suppression, and here's the big one, self-deception to support their deceptive behavior. Now, this is just the psychology behind lying under oath. Um, these are just some theories and concepts that I kind of sat with and I was like, what makes a person, you know, do this and do it with a straight face and, and do it where the whole world really is watching under scrutiny. And it can't be, um, it just can't be a comfortable position uh, to be in. But I just felt that we could all gain some deeper insight um, in this just by understanding the psychological mechanisms that that underpin lying under oath and some of the complex interplay between, say, like um, the cognitive, emotional, and, and even the social factors involved in this type of deceptive behavior. So again, that's my take on it. You all know, I wanna know what you think. I hope you were able to hang out until the end and, and see you know what it means, but I'd love to know, what do you think about this? Again, we have, the, the judge said it's gonna be a couple of weeks until he comes back with um, his final decision of um, what's gonna happen. So yeah, let me know what you think. Go ahead, um, leave a comment and please, please don't forget, subscribe to the channel. Please, please, please hit the like button and I will see you in the next video.